السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Welcome to the Mothers of the Believers and if you remember in the last episode we started speaking about this great story the slander that was brought forth against Aisha رضي الله عنها and it's important for us to know this story and to analyze it in detail because in it was the defense brought down on the side of Aisha رضي الله عنها from Allah سبحانه وتعالى and we want to look at this story and last time we started so today we're going to continue with that inshallah we'll give you a quick recap when we begin inshallah Assalamu alaikum wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah alameen And we're talking about Aisha radiallahu anha as siddiqa the daughter of as siddiq This is actually the second episode And last time very quickly we started to speak about how Aisha radiallahu anha went out with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during one of the ghazawat, one of the expeditions And she was a young girl and she had her hawda which is like a box they put on top of the camel that has like curtains all around it and she said the army had camped somewhere on their way back to Medina and she went out far in the desert to relieve to, or to answer the call of nature when she came back she found that a necklace of hers had gone and she went back to look for it when she came uh, she said you know, she came back she found that the army had left her because the men who carried the hawda they basically she was st uh, still a young girl so it was very light and they they couldn't feel that it was empty, so they just put it and they were uh, in their manners, they didn't ask how are you doing, are you inside, are you there, they just carried it, they put it on top of the hawda, four strong men, they didn't feel that she wasn't inside, and the army left. So she says then, uh, they drove away uh, and they proceeded, they went away and proceeded. She says then, I found my necklace after the army had gone, I came to, to their camp but found no one there, so I went to the place where I used to stay. This is from how intelligent she is. When, you, when, when people lose you, if you get lost from a group, they will most likely come to the last place that you stayed. And the intelligent person will always wait there. So let's say you're touring with a group of people, you're touring a city, and then you, you get lost from the group. Wait in the last place you were. Stay in your place. Don't try to run around looking for them. Then they come back to the original place and you're not there then. So Aisha out of her intelligence, she said, I went to, this, to the place where I used to stay, thinking that they would miss me, meaning they would notice that I'm gone, and come back and, and search for me. She says, while I was sitting at my place, I felt sleepy and I slept. So what happens? So Afwan ibn Mu'attil al-Sulami, uh, he was behind the army. So he would always, back then, there would be someone who would stay behind the army, and uh, he would do a lot of things. He would be like a lookout, and he would also... Uh, like pick up things behind uh, after the army if they lose or forget anything and so on and so forth. So she said he had started in the last part of the night and reached my place in the morning and saw the figure of a sleeping person. She said he came to me and recognized me. So the question is how did he recognize Aisha radiallahu anha? She said he came to me and recognized me on seeing me when he saw her. Why? Look she explains it. This is hadith now in Bukhari. Because she, he used to see me before the veiling, before the hijab. The hijab is covering the face. So she said he recognized me because he saw me before the, this, the veiling was revealed. And that's why he knew what I looked like. So then she said, I woke up because of his saying, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Verily we are to Allah and to him we return. She said, he said that upon recognizing me. She said, What's the first thing now? Let's look at the first thing that she did when she woke up. She said, I covered my face with my garment. And then look what she says. And wallahi, he did not say to me a single word except inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Never said anything else beside that. Until he made his she camel kneel down. So he made the camel kneel down. And then I got on it. And uh, then Safwan set out. And he was leading the camel that was carrying me until we caught up with the army while they were resting during like the, the midday, like a very hot time of day. She said then, 
<coughs> whoever was meant for destruction fell into destruction. And the leader of the ifk, meaning this lie, which is like a forged statement, it's a lie. And what, she, what it mean that whoever meant to, uh, was meant for destruction fell into destruction, meaning whoever Allah, يعني, who, or whoever was intended to say something that would destroy him, meaning some accusation, he said it. She says now in the hadith, the leader of the ifk was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. So we see something interesting. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, very famous, very famous hypocrite in Medina. Now, she recognizes him as the leader of this false statement, as this lie. So that means he was known as the one who caused it. And she says, after this, we arrived at Medina and I became ill for one month while the people were spreading for these lies about me uh, and I was not aware of anything that was happening. So what happened here is that, uh, just from other narrations, we understand what happened, that Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sulul, he was sitting, and when he saw Aisha radiallahu anha and uh, Safwan here entering, he said something, it wasn't explicit, he didn't say anything like fornication or anything like that, but he said Aisha and Safwan, wallahi, he didn't leave her until he got something from her and she got something from him. Now, this is not very explicit, so he can't be whipped or punished because of that. He just said, got something from her and got something from him. He didn't say anything like zina or anything like that. But everyone knew that he was the one who started that. So she's saying that we arrived in Medina, I became ill when they arrived. She was sick for a whole month. And meanwhile, the people were spreading these lies, these statements, and the news was spreading and spreading and spreading. She said, I didn't know anything that was happening. I was not aware of anything. But what aroused my doubt while I was sick was that I was no longer receiving from the Messenger وسلم, the same kind of kindness I used to receive when I was sick. So you see, here she's saying the Prophet didn't treat me the same way as he usually did when I fell sick. She said the Prophet would enter upon me and say a greeting and he would say, كَيْفَ تِلْكُمْ meaning like, how is that lady? And then he would leave. She, she said that aroused my suspicion but I was not aware of like the evil until I recovered from the illness. She was sick for a month, people spreading the news, she didn't know what was happening. Just to give you more insight from another narration, what was happening is that uh, at this point people kept repeating the sentence of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, but no one explicitly said uh, the, the word zina except for a few people. From amongst them is Mistah ibn Abi Mistah, even though he's one of the people of Badr. He in the end said the word zina. And Hamna bin Tujahsh, the sister of Zainab bin Tujahsh, she said the word zina. And Hassan ibn Thabit as well, the poet of the Prophet. So, subhanAllah, you see how the hypocrite started hinting, but the good, not hypocrite, the good believers fell into it. And that's the danger of these kinds of things. So, now we said Mistah ibn Abi Mistah is the one who said it, right? Look what happens. She says, I went out with Umm Mistah, the mother of Mistah, to answer the call of nature. And uh, she, in a place where everyone used to go to relieve themselves. And she says, I used to not go out for this purpose except at night, from night to night. And that was before we had uh, lavatories, like bathrooms close to our houses. So this is before they made bathrooms near the houses. They used to go far out. And she says this was our habit of ours, similar to the habit of the old Arabs in the deserts or in the tents, that uh, we would, they would go out at night and uh, they considered it troublesome and harmful to take the bathroom inside the houses. That's why they didn't have them inside the home. In any case, we've actually come to the end of this segment, so when we return, we're going to continue with the story of the ifk, inshallah. The Journey of Ibrahim salam, is geared as an educational documentary that will take the audience through the footsteps of Ibrahim and the Muslims today as they perform the once-in-a-lifetime journey of Hajj. 
The story is told by some of our well-known scholars of today as they reveal the importance and significance of the Muslim's Hajj and how it relates to the journey of the father of religions, Ibrahim. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back. We're talking about the ifk. We're talking about Aisha radiallahu anha came back from Medina. She was ill for a month, didn't know what's happening, what lies people are spreading. So then after she became well, she went out with the mother of Mistah radiallahu anhu, who is the man. Even though he attended Badr, he was unfortunately of the, the people who used the word zina. Him and Hamna bin Tujahsh and Hassan bin Thabit. So she says, I went out with Umm Mistah. They were going out to the, relieve themselves. And uh, her son, she said, was Mistah ibn Uthatha. And when we had finished, you know, answering the call of nature, uh, Umm Mistah and I, we came backwards, we came back towards the house. She says, Umm Mistah then stumbled over her robe and she like almost like fell or she fell in some narrations. And when she fell, she said, Ta'isa Mistah. She said, let Mistah be ruined. So then Aisha said to her, what a bad thing that you have said. Do you curse a man who has taken part in the battle of Badr? So then her mother tells her, you there, didn't you hear what he has said? So then Aisha, has, because she was ill, she had no clue what he had said. So she asked her, what did he say? And then Aisha says, she then told me the statement of the people of Ifk, meaning this lie, which added to my ailment. She became sick again. When I returned home, the Prophet ﷺ came to me, and after greeting, he said, how, كيف تلكم, how is the lady? And I said, will you allow me to go to my parents? And at that time, she said, I wanted to be sure of the news through my parents. I couldn't ask this to the Prophet ﷺ. So she says, the Prophet ﷺ allowed me and I went to my parents and I asked my mother, Oh mother, what are the people talking about? So then she says, my mother said, Oh daughter, she said, yani, kind of like relax, you know, don't. She says, For, because by Allah there is not a charming lady who is loved by her husband and who has and whose husband has other wives, except that they will find some fault in her. So then Aisha said, I said, Subhanallah, did the people really talk about that? She says, that night I kept on weeping the whole night until morning. She could not stop. She says, my tears never stop, nor did I sleep, and morning broke while I was still crying. Can you imagine? She never slept and she never stopped crying all night. So then the Prophet ﷺ called Ali ibn Abi Talib and Usama ibn Zayd when the divine revelation was delayed. So no ayat came down or, no, uh, or not even a message from Jibreel came to either make her guilty or declare her innocence. So the Prophet ﷺ now, now you might ask why didn't the Prophet ﷺ just say no? I know Aisha, she's a righteous woman, she, can, she won't do that. Why didn't he do that? I mean, most people today, even if their, their daughter doesn't wear a hijab, they will deny it. So why didn't the Prophet ﷺ deny it? Because you have to understand, the Prophet ﷺ was in the place of a judge. So he cannot believe nor deny without evidence, because he was in the place of a judge. But if he were to take it based on what we, he knew from Aisha, he would have immediately said that she is innocent. So the Prophet ﷺ now wanted to consult people. So he called Ali ibn Abi Talib and Usama ibn Zayd. Why these two people? Why Ali ibn Abi Talib and Usama ibn Zayd? Because of course they were from his household and he, he raised both of them. So and he, Zayd ibn Haritha was raised by the Prophet ﷺ. This is his son, Usama ibn Zayd. And Ali ibn Abi Talib was raised by the Prophet ﷺ as we discussed. So then when there was no kind of inspiration or anything or revelation, he, he called those two, Ali and Usama anhuma, to consult with them uh, on the idea of, of, or on the issue of what to do about this situation. So Usama ibn Zayd, he told the Prophet ﷺ what he knew about the innocence of Aisha radiallahu anha and, uh, the, and how much the Prophet ﷺ loved her. That's what he mentioned. And he said, oh, Allah, oh, oh Messenger of Allah, she is your wife and we do not know anything about her except good. But Ali ibn Abi Talib said, O oh Allah's Prophet, Allah does not impose restrictions on you and there are plenty of women other than her. If however, but see, so now this was the first suggestion of Ali radiallahu anhu. It's uh, because this was the first, and he has two suggestions. The first one, he's saying that you, you don't have, I mean, there are other women besides her. Uh, it's kind of like to lessen of, of the, the severity of the issue. And if it was that severe, you can marry any other woman that you want. But 
this is now his real judgment. He said, if however, uh, if you however ask her slave girl, her servant girl, she will tell you the truth. Why? And you here you see the wisdom of Ali radiallahu anhu. Why the servant girl? Because the servants are people who are always with you. They're in close proximity to you. And they see you in every situation in your home, during the day, when you're alone, at night. And they know of your secrets. And they know if you're an energetic person. They know if you're a lazy person. They know if you're an honest person or a liar. Because they're there with you. So he said, ask her servant girl and she will tell you the truth. So then Aisha, going back to her narrating the story, she says, So then the Prophet ﷺ called for Barira. And he said, Ya Barira, did you ever see anything which might have aroused your suspicion? Uh, meaning as regards to Aisha. And now as we know, like I said, the Prophet ﷺ is in the place of a judge. That's why he's asking these questions. So Barira said, Wallahi, who has sent you, by Allah, who has sent you with the truth. I have never seen anything regarding Aisha which I would blame her for. It is said here, that Ali kind of was a little strong with her because he wanted to get things out of her. So she swore, she said that well, by the one who has sent you with the truth, I have never seen anything regarding Aisha which I would blame her for except, except what? Remember now, this is someone who sees you night and day and knows all your secrets. What's the worst thing that the servant girl could say about Aisha radiallahu anha? She said except that she is a girl of immature age who sometimes sleeps and leaves the dough of her family unprotected so that the domestic goats come and eat from it. That's, what, that's all that she could say. Is that Aisha was young, sometimes she would sleep after mixing the flour and the water and the dough. She would leave it unprotected and the goat would come eat it. That's the worst thing. Imagine that's the worst thing someone could say about you is that sometimes you sleep and the goat will eat the dough. Uh, we all wish that was the worst thing about us. Sani. So then, um, so but the, the narration shows you really the excellence of Aisha radiallahu anha. That's the worst thing that someone could say about her radiallahu anha. So then the Prophet sallam, Aisha narrates, he got up and he ad to address the people. And he asked for somebody who would take revenge on, on Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Then the Prophet sallam, went while on the pulpit, he said, O oh Muslims, who will help me against a man who has hurt me by slandering my family? By Allah, I know nothing. So now you see here, this is what the Prophet ﷺ knows about his family. I know nothing except good about my family. And people have blamed a man of whom I know nothing except good. So here she's saying, uh, she's talking about Safwan ibn Mu'attil. Uh, the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ is saying that I know nothing except good about him from the people of Badr, from the righteous companions. And he never used to visit my family except with me. So then Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh from the Ansar, he got up. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, Wallahi, I will relieve you of him. Is he, is he's, if he is from the tribe of Al-Aws, then I will chop his head off. So, so here Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, he is from the tribe of Al-Aws. He said, if he is from Al-Aws, then I will chop his head off. And if he is from our brothers, Al-Khazraj, then you give us the order and we will obey it. So now this is the, the, the leader of Al-Aws, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. He says if he's from Al-Khazraj, because they were the two largest tribes in Medina, Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is saying if he's from our tribe, we'll kill him, we'll cut, chop his head off. If, he, if he's from our brothers, Al-Khazraj, and before Islam there used to be a lot of wars and problems between the two tribes. So he says if he's from Al-Khazraj, give us the order and then we will obey it, meaning we'll, we'll kill him. So then Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, and he was the chief of Al-Khazraj. He was incited. Aisha radiallahu anhu says he was a pious man, but he was incited by zeal for his tribe. So he said to Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, he says, By Allah the Eternal, you have told a lie. You will not kill him and you will never be able to kill him. So on that, Usaid ibn Hudayr got up. So you see how the situation is getting out of hand now. Usaid ibn Hudayr got up and he was the cousin of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. So because Sa'd ibn Mu'adh now was attacked by uh, Sa'd ibn Ubad. So then he got up and said to Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, You are a liar, and by Allah the Eternal, we will surely kill him, and you are a hypocrite defending the hypocrites. So, so then the two tribes of Al-Aws and Al-Khadraj got so excited until they were at the point of fighting with each other while the Prophet ﷺ was standing on the mimbar, standing on the pulpit. So uh, just to show you to what degree the situation, uh, what level the situation reached, that they're even about to fight, while the Prophet ﷺ is right there on the mimbar. So much confusion caused by this issue. So then, uh, the Prophet, uh, actually, we actually we need to take a break and we'll continue right after when we come back, inshallah. So stay with us. <laughs> How you doing? I can't believe you 
Let yeah. him do this. Why not? He can handle it. I don't know, it's only his first time. So? Everybody's doing it. Yeah, man. Hey, everybody's got experience. He didn't have to. Man, you don't look so good. Man, I feel good. <laughs> hey, is he okay? Hey, what's wrong? Hey, we better pull over. What's going on back there? He's not breathing. Pull over, pull over! Oh my god! كل نفس ذائقة الموت وإنما توفون أجوركم يوم القيامة فمن زحزح عن النار وأدخل الجنة فقد فاز وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور Welcome back to the show. So we're still talking about the incident of the Ifk and the two tribes of Al-Aws of Al-Khazraj and Khazraj. They got so upset, they almost started fighting while the Prophet ﷺ was still up on the member. So the Prophet ﷺ then continued to quiet them down until they all became silent and then he became silent. She says, Aisha says, on that day I kept on weeping so much that, that neither did my tears stop nor could I sleep. So non-stop crying. She says, in the morning my parents were with me and I had wept for two nights and a day without sleeping and with incessant tears. So two nights and a day, no sleeping, non-stop, the tears didn't stop until they thought that my liver would burst with weeping. Look at how much she's going through. Look at how much her family is going through. And she says, while they were with me and I was weeping, a woman from the Ansar asked permission to see me. So I admitted her and she sat and she started to weep with me. And this is something that a talent that only women have that if their friend cries, they can just come sit down and start crying with them as well. So uh, she says, while I was in that state, uh, the Prophet ﷺ came to us and he greeted us and he sat down. And she said he had never sat with me since the day that what was said was said, since, since they said what was said. So then he had stayed a month without receiving any divine inspiration, not revelation, but any inspiration, even a message from Jibreel concerning my case. So then the Prophet ﷺ recited the tajahud after he had sat down and then he said, O oh Aisha, I have been informed this such and such a thing about you. And if you're innocent, Allah will reveal your innocence. And if you have committed a sin, then ask for Allah's forgiveness and repent to Him. For when a slave confesses his sin and then repents to Allah, Allah accepts his repentance. So you see, the Prophet ﷺ, again, proving he's in the place of a judge. If you're innocent, Allah will prove it. If you've made a mistake, then repent, and Allah will accept your repentance. So then, when the Prophet ﷺ finished his speech, Aisha radiallahu anha says, My tears completely stopped and I no, no longer felt a single drop of tears because she got upset now. The Prophet said something like this to her. So she says, Then I said to my father, Reply to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, on my behalf as to what he said. So answer him. And then her father Abu Bakr said, By Allah, I do not know what to say to Allah's Messenger. Then she says, I said to my mother, Reply to Allah's Prophet. And she said, I do not know what to say to the Prophet ﷺ. And because she was still a young girl, she says, still a young girl I was uh, as I was, and though I had little knowledge of the Qur'an, I said, Wallah, I know that you heard this story, meaning this lie, so much, I mean, meaning so many times that it has been planted in your minds and you have believed it. So now, look how intelligent she is, even though as a young girl. She's saying, you heard it so many times, it's been planted in your minds that you believe it. So now if I tell you that I'm innocent, and Allah knows that I'm innocent, you will not believe me. And if I confess something, and Allah knows that I'm innocent of it, you will believe me. So if I tell you the truth, you won't believe me, and Allah knows it. And if I confess that I did it, even though I didn't, you will believe me. Then she says, Wallahi, I cannot find of you an example except of Abu Yusuf. She, she wanted to say Ya'qub alayhi salam. If you want to quote Ya'qub alayhi salam from the Quran. So she said, I, she couldn't think of the name of Ya'qub alayhi salam. She said, the father of Yusuf alayhi salam. So she says, for me, a good patience is most befitting against that which you assert, and it is Allah whose help can be sought. She says, then I turned away and lay on my bed 
And at that time, I knew that I was innocent and that Allah would reveal my innocence. But then look what she says. She says, I know Allah is going to reveal my innocence. But wallahi, I never thought that Allah would send down a Qur'an about my affair, divine inspiration that I would be, that would be recited forever, meaning Qur'an. So I considered myself, she says, as I considered myself too unworthy to be talked of by Allah with something that was to be recited. So she says, I was not worthy, I didn't consider myself to be worthy of Qur'an being recited about me. But what she had hoped was that, she says, I hope that Allah's Apostle or Allah's Prophet might have a vision in which Allah would prove my innocence. But she says, Wallahi, the Prophet ﷺ had not left his seat and nobody had left the house when the divine revelation came to the Prophet ﷺ. And so she says, so there overtook him the same hard condition which used to overtake him when he was inspired, like when he was getting revelation. So that the drops of his sweat were running down like pearls, even though it was a cold winter day. And that was because of the heaviness of the statement which was revealed to him. So this is how the Prophet ﷺ reacted when the Qur'an was being revealed to him. He would sweat even though it was a cold day. She said when that state of the Prophet ﷺ was over, meaning the sweat and the heaviness of the revelation, he was smiling when he was relieved. And the first word he said was, Aisha, Allah has declared your innocence. So then she says, my mother said to me, get up and go to him, meaning go thank the Prophet ﷺ. So she said, by Allah, this is Aisha saying, Wallahi, I will not go to him and I will not thank anybody but Allah. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ Verily those who spread the slander are a gang from among you. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ لَا تَحْسَبُوهُ شَرًّا لَكُمْ بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ لِكُلِّ امْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَكْتَسَبَ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ وَالَّذِي تَوَلَّى كِبَرَهُ مِنْهُمْ لَهُ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals verily those who spread the slander are a gang or like a small band amongst you. So first you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it the slander or called it ifk which is a severe lie. So Allah called it a lie. And if we're going to look at in detail what the ayat are saying and what the wisdoms are because now we're towards the end uh, of the episode. So uh, what we're going to do is right now we're just going to continue with the narration. When Allah revealed this, uh, Aisha says, when Allah revealed this to confirm my innocence, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq who used to provide for Mistah, because Mistah, he was the one who used the word zina. She said, the Abu Bakr, because he used to provide for Mistah, he said, by Allah, I will never provide for Mistah anything after what he has said about Aisha. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then Reveal. وَلَا يَأْتَ لِأُولُو الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُولِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Allah said, Let not those amongst you who are good and are wealthy swear not to give to their kinsmen, those in need, and those who have left their homes for Allah's cause. What happens? We're going to continue, inshallah, next episode with this, inshallah. So thank you for being an attentive audience.